Welcome to the newsroom. I'm Owen Poindexter, senior writer with Front Office Sports. The World Cup is just a couple weeks old and is already all kinds of fascinating, intriguing, sometimes troubling storylines coming out of that tournament. There's both some great soccer and some disappointing soccer for some teams, but also just a whole lot going on with the media, uh, player protests. Uh, countries trying to protest and players kind of getting caught in the middle of it. So, so many interesting narratives to tug on here. We're going to be doing that with our writer Doug Greenberg in just a moment. 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. Dot com crash, housing crash, and the roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? The answer is NetSuite. NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and easily see where to save money. That's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. What are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash the newsroom right now. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. All right, excited to get into this. Joined today by our writer, Doug Greenberg. How's it going, Doug? Doing pretty good, Owen. Uh, I'm just home in the uh, Boston area visiting my family for the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, so that's why my setting's a little bit, I'm sitting in my sister's room right now, so... <laughs> uh, a little bit, a little bit different setting, but good. How, how about you doing, man? I'm good. Yeah, we're recording this on Monday, so still in the wake of the whole Thanksgiving rigmarole. Had the great pleasure of not traveling for Thanksgiving and not facing, you know, massive crowds everywhere you look. Um, biggest difference, would you say, or like when you're in Boston, do you have like moments where you're like, I am not in Chicago because you're from live in Chicago from Boston. Is there some like key difference where you're like, oh, I'm home? Namely, I mean, I'm just living in, uh, you know, I'm at my parents' house in the suburbs, which is, you know, way nicer than my apartment in Chicago. So, <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> and I get my and I get my parents feeding me for, you know, four days or whatever. It's not mm -hmm. it's not the worst thing in the world, but uh, yeah, yeah, easy to get yeah. used to. Well, it can be a little bit of adjustment to come home, and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> dinner's yeah, not exactly. going to just show up in front of me, is it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> cool. So we're talking World Cup today, but before we do that, uh, I just wanted to like check in on like your sports world more broadly. What's what's just like popped on your radar the last couple of weeks outside of the massive global tournament happening in Qatar? Oh man. Um, well, as a Boston fan, uh, the NHL and NBA seasons are going really well for me. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, I, I don't really, especially the Bruins, I have no idea where that came from. Like, they just are suddenly so good. Um, so that's been so that's been cool. Um, the NFL season has been really weird in general. Um, I I keep saying that I don't think there's an elite team in the NFL this year. Yeah, that's how I feel, yeah. too. Like, going in, it's like, okay, KC, Buffalo, at least them. And, like, mm -hmm. it seemed like, you know, the Rams were pretty good having just, you know, won a pretty solidly won Super Bowl. Um, yep. But yeah, it's like everywhere you look, like the team you thought was good is like not that good. Like they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, and the NHL. So um, I am also like experiencing this like very like delightful whiplash because I somehow grew up a massive New Jersey Devils fan despite growing up in New York and going to a lot of Rangers games. Um, right. I was a was and am a huge Devils fan, but I'd kind of like the Devils fandom hadn't, it didn't go away, but I was like, okay, like they can't even make the playoffs like most years in a league where half the teams do make the playoffs. So like, I don't know, guys, like wake me up when, when something good happens. And now they, they can't stop winning. They've lost one game in like the last 14, I think. And I think they had three goals disallowed in a, in a one goal game in that. So it's like almost a nightly ritual for me where I get my kids to bed and then I watch the 10 minute highlight package on YouTube uh, from the latest Devils game. And it's like, oh, sweet. They won like 4 1 again. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Who would have thought? Look at us. Like the uh, the Devils and the Bruins just sitting atop the NHL right now. I mean, and yeah. yeah. Like the, Bru the Bruins were, you know, they've always been like a average to above average team. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I was expecting again this year. And then they've just been absolutely white hot like this whole season. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, whenever I check the standings, it's like, okay, Devils have won 12 games in a row, so the season's not that old. They should be in first place in the conference. And actually, no, the Bruins are, like, a game better. Because, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, the exactly. Bruins are just, like, ridiculous right now. Yeah. Um, all right, so shifting over to the World Cup. Um, so it's been a pretty interesting tournament so far. And, you know, we're only, like, halfway through the group stage, basically. But a lot to see so far, both on the field and off. Um, you spoke to Grant Wall at our World Cup forum uh, just before the tournament started, and he made a, a pretty good point, which I think has turned out to be pretty prescient, which is that the timing of this tournament is going to have an impact because usually it's in the summer and there's not a whole lot going on in European soccer. But this is like right in the middle of what's usually the European soccer season. So I'm wondering what you've seen in terms of how the timing and, and anything else in terms of this, the peculiar situation of this tournament has affected the on-field results so far? I don't know. I mean, I feel like in general, the teams that you would expect to be doing well are doing well, and the teams that aren't... Well, I mean, there were some surprises in the first round, obviously. I mean, Argentina losing that first game uh, was huge, but it doesn't seem like it affected them too badly. Uh, you know, they, they won comfortably in the second game. Um but I'm just pulling up the bracket here, so or I'm pulling up the standings here, so I have it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, I'm just thinking about how they've had to stop the seasons in the middle. I, I think, you know, from my perspective, like the, the domestic leagues were in a really weird spot. Um, the Premier League was really strange before they got to the break, in my opinion. Like there's just the, the Premier League table looks way weirder than it usually has. And I don't know if that was a result of the world cup but you know you got teams like newcastle up at the top you have fulham in the top 10 um you know you got brighton in the top seven you've got wolves at the very bottom um and again who knows if that had anything to do with the world cup or not like players focusing on trying to be healthy for that um but in terms of the results at the world cup i mean the, the group stage has been great you know there i believe there's only two teams that are out of contention right now um, one of them being the host, one of them being the host Qatar. And I'm trying to remember, I think there was a, and Canada actually, which right, I, I will say surprised. that's yeah. Canada showing that, showing that badly. was definitely disappointing because I think a lot of people expected a lot from them, especially since it was their first appearance in like 40 years or something like that. Um, so definitely a bummer that they didn't do better. And especially with a player like Alfonso Davies, who's as good as he is. Um, you know, they put up a good fight yesterday, but not meant to be, unfortunately. I think that was probably one of the bigger disappointments of the tournament from a from a soccer perspective. Yeah, Herc Gomez, who I talked to uh, at that World Cup forum, got me excited about Canada. So I had them advancing to the the elimination rounds uh, in my World Cup bracket with some friends, and that that is not going to come to pass. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, same. Well, actually, I will say same here. Like I had my I had Canada advancing as well. Um, that group is actually looking very bad for me because I had Croatia finishing last in the group oh, and, they're yeah, in, right. and then they're in first. And I, I will say Croatia looks great. I mean, I thought they were getting too old with, um, you know, Luka Modric is really getting up there in age, but he's played fine. The rest of the team has looked really good. And, you know, Croatia, they, they never, they never went away. Uh, you know, they were content. They've been contenders before, and I guess they're still contenders again. They're leading that group right now. Yeah. And how have all the 0-0 zero, zero games struck you? Do, you? do you see that and you're like, well, you know, that that's soccer. You get a lot of 0-0 zero, zero games. Or is it, you know, anything more to it? <sighs> that's soccer. Uh, <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> the best way of putting it. You know, I was, because that was the thing, is I was I was actually watching with some friends, uh, one of my good friends and his, like, sister-in-law yesterday. And she's, like, not a big soccer watcher. And she was mm -hmm. just like, that England USA game was so boring. Like, <laughs> why does anybody watch this sport? Like, and, and and I will say that it was, you know, from a ratings perspective and, and just from like kind of breaking down that game for a second. Um, it, it is a bummer. It's a bummer from a like fan perspective. That game ended zero zero. It's great. It was great for the US. It was a really well played game for them. Like, yeah. that's a great result for them, obviously. Um, but from a like trying to build soccer in the United States perspective, not great because this match was hyped up so much and then it ended zero zero. So all the casual fans are just like, what the heck was that? Like, that wasn't yeah. fun. Like, that wasn't a great match. Like all these casual fans who wouldn't normally watch. And, you know, it came, it kind of came through in the numbers. It was 
the most watched men's soccer match ever but it honestly could have even been more than that it was it ended up with 50 a little over 15 million viewers um and that was just on just on fox it added i think another five ish million on telemundo um i think they could have been a lot more if that had been a good game um because i I think a lot more people would have wanted to like tune in when they were seeing what was happening on social media but um but i mean granted it was still the most watched men's game of all time and you know, we're, we'll, we'll get ahead of this and say we're recording this before the U.S. game. So uh, hopefully, it, assuming the U.S. has moved on to the knockout stage, we'll, we'll have to see what those knockout stage uh, viewership numbers are going to look like for them. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so we're recording this on Monday. By Thursday, when you're listening to this, you will know what we don't know, which is how the U.S.-Iran game turned out. That, from where we sit right now, it looks like a really high stakes game for the U.S. Because one, it determines whether or not they move on to the elimination rounds. Uh, two, if like, yeah, this is a very hyped World Cup for the U.S. That match against England, obviously, with, you know, the the Western world was watching that one. And if they finish this thing with a draw against Wales, a 0-0 draw against England, and a draw or a loss against Iran um, with, you know, we have a bunch of like weird stuff leading up to that, which we'll get into in a sec. Um, it'll be like, well, okay, that was it, huh? <laughs> like it's like the firework went up and then it just like never went off. It just kind of fizzled and went back down. Um, so yeah, it should be very interesting. Or like they could win and then make some noise, like knock out a couple teams. You know, I don't know, get to the round of eight or something and build a bunch of hype for U.S. soccer that then like spills over into MLS and is still kind of going when the World Cup comes here in four years we shall see two two very different outcomes which uh again our listeners will have a slightly better uh slightly more informed view of uh by the time they're listening to this um before we get into us iran all the protests some stuff with the media um are there any teams that have kind of popped for you or you know we mentioned canada and croatia any other teams where um uh things have not gone according to expectations for you so I don't know if this is not according to expectations, but um, France is one of the, as of now, as of our recording, France is one of the only teams to have advanced so far. France and Brazil, yeah. I believe, are the only two. And, you know, on the surface, that doesn't seem significant. France are the defending champions, and they have one of the most talented squads in the world. But it's actually significant because uh, Grant Wall, when I talked to him, pointed out that four of the last five previous champions had failed to get out of the group stage. Hmm. Um, so it's like a weird, like previous champion curse, which France was able to break this time. Um, you know, good for them. I mean, they have, they have some of the best players in the world. It makes sense that they should do that. Um, so I, I mean, that was surprising in a, like, uh, what do you want to call that? Like a, uh, a superstitious kind of way. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. But not surprising from a skill perspective, right? Um, yeah. And then, I mean, I'm seeing who else is, is who. I'm just looking at the standings and seeing if anything else is really standing out to me. Um, any other disappointment? I mean, Mexico going out is is yeah. a real bummer. It's a bummer for North American folks. I don't know if it's a disappointment necessarily, but um, you know, I, I think a lot of people were high on Denmark. Uh, they have not performed up to par necessarily. Um, you look at like a. And then, and then teams that have maybe outperformed, you're looking at right now as we're recording, uh, Ghana has looked good. Morocco has looked good. Japan has looked really good. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. They've kind of come out of nowhere with that one. Um, and and as of now, Iran's sitting, you know, in second place. They, you know, have looked, you know, getting that that win against Wales was huge for them. Um and and Wales failing to get a win as of now, which I don't think they're going to beat England either. And maybe I will be wrong <laughs> when this podcast <laughs> comes out, but um, I don't see that happening, especially, you know, England's probably going to have to jockey for position. And they also, well, I guess if the U.S. wins, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't think that's a game that England's going to want to give up. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll just, we'll just kind of have to see what happens. Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, both, winning a game in this tournament if nothing else is if nothing else a morale victory for for those teams and those countries um both of them i think there are questions about them being in the tournament to begin with both for the from the quality of their teams but also what their countries are doing and that's a separate issue and 
there's a very active debate over should there be like human rights standards to get into the World Cup, which is a very funny, fraught topic. Um, but just the fact that they show that they can hang against the top teams in the world is, you know, a, a morale victory for their soccer teams, regardless of what's going on in the rest of their countries. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to talk about like a big victory, right? I mean, Saudi Arabia getting that win against Argentina I, by the numbers, you know, from a betting perspective, from a player value perspective, um, Saudi Arabia's win over Argentina is probably considered one of the biggest upsets in the history of the tournament. Um, you know, those players were, I believe, are all getting bought Rolls Royces by the crown prince. Um, so it's a yeah, I mean, that was a humongous victory for them, um, you know, regardless of political implications um, with these countries. Uh, from a soccer perspective, that was absolutely massive. Yeah. And so let's get into all the other stuff that's going on, because because there's been plenty. So we've alluded to some stuff with the U.S. and Iran. Um, and so for me, the the first chapter of that, and it's sort of unrelated, but... There are massive protests going on in the country of Iran right now uh, over women's rights and human rights, human rights. And um, the Iranian players for their first game, um, they did not sing their national anthem, which was, you know, a, seen as a protest um, to, to stand in solidarity with the, the protesters in that country. They've since been pressured into singing the national anthem. But, you know, they, they made their statement. Now there's... Um, uh, an issue that actually you just wrote about, Doug, uh, around the uh, a display of the Iranian flag. So could you fill us in on, on this one? Yeah, so basically uh, over the weekend, the United States posted a couple of graphics on social media where they purposely omitted the center emblem from the Iranian flag, uh, which is a stylized kind of uh, emblem of the word Allah. Which so obviously that's gonna really really ruffle some feathers. Um, I also know just from looking at the you know from going through the story that um, one of the big debates or not or one of the big kind of uh, points of this whole thing is that protesters have been flying the Persian the traditional Persian flag, um, which features a a lion and a sun I believe. Um, and that was the original Iranian flag before the current regime came into power. And so, you know, I think for the U.S., that was a moment for them to kind of say they, they came out and said, like, we were doing this as a show of solidarity um, for for women getting basic human rights in Iran. And for anyone who doesn't know the full backstory on that, um, basically, there have been protests happening in Iran ever since the um, the killing of a woman uh who back in i believe it was in october um and there have basically been some protests there have been a lot of protests around the country you know widespread more so than any of the ones that they've had in recent years um over 400 people have been killed in the protests reportedly so obviously this is a big moment and it's happening on this stage uh for everyone to watch so i think the u.s was trying to do its part um you know iran was obviously extremely unhappy with that. They were calling for the U S to basically be suspended for the rest of the world cup. Um, you know, they, cause they, they even cited the FIFA rule book saying that they were, uh, there's a, there's a rule in FIFA rule book where if you disrespect another country's culture or, or something like that, then you can be, um, you know, you can be, you can be suspended for 10 matches and that's what Iran was calling for. So, yeah, the whole situation is is so messy um, and it's, you know, there have been tensions between the United States and Iran for decades and it's coming to the forefront. It's one of those, right, like one of those situations where sports is kind of bringing politics right to the forefront. Um, and and if anything else, it's it's actually highlighting these protests that are happening in Iran right now. Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting moment we're in right now. We're like... The World Cup, the idealized version, one that Gianni Infantino, the uh, head of FIFA, has really promoted recently, is that the World Cup is this coming together of nations. You know, like we may have our differences in the rest of the world, but this is a moment, you know, kind of like the Olympics, where we can all come together, united by sport, to to do this. And maybe it makes us feel a little bit warmer toward each other. But 
so there's that element of it. And obviously that's why Qatar wanted the World Cup in the first place is, you know, they've, they've got plenty of human rights issues and that, and so they, they wanted to like kind of have this warm, fuzzy moment in their country where they show off their beautiful, lavish stadiums. And, and it's a amazing thing that everyone gets to watch. And in Qatar is all over the place, both the country, but also like Qatar energy and uh, one of their major banks or major sponsors of the tournament. So you're just seeing Qatar everywhere. And, and so there is that going on, but there's also like all the attention that it does bring to their human rights issues. Same with Iran. Um, you know, they're, I think they're thrilled to be in the tournament. They're thrilled to have put up a win. Uh, but the players themselves are also taking this moment to shine a light on what's going on in their country. And because it's, it's such a, the whole meaning of the World Cup is so bound up in the symbolism of it. And then when you take something that, like the symbol of the country, the flag, and, and mess with that, um, you know, that feels like such a, you know, like a, President Biden might have to like answer questions about this now. It's like everything, the attention on it is so, so magnified. Um, so even like a little thing, like a, a tweet like this can can have such huge implications. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's just... <laughs> It's, it's really interesting. And, and, you know, the players are kind of, they're both caught in the middle of this where, like, they're there to play soccer. They're, they're there to, like, try to win the, you know, possibly the biggest prize in, in global sports. But it is the biggest prize in global sports because it's, there's so much attention and excitement around this, this one tournament. So it's kind of unavoidable in some way. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's worth noting that, um, you know, United States manager Greg Barhalter and none of the players, uh, none of them knew that the social media team was going to do this. Um, I, right. Frankly, who even knows if the highest levels of the U.S. Soccer Federation, they might not have known that they were going to do this. Um, so who really like knows? It really could have been one of those like one rogue intern kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, like how many definitely... people would spot a difference in the Iranian flag in the like U.S. soccer team, social team? Yeah. And who knows? Like maybe, right, maybe like one person did this and then they had to spin it into, yep, we stand in solidarity with the women of Iran. Who knows? But um, I mean, either way, now it is a political statement. It's a, it, whatever you want to call it, it's it's a statement that's out there. And it's also worth noting that the um, Iran's state affiliated uh, news agency called Tazneem News Agency, they actually changed their Twitter banner to a group of people burning an American flag. Oh, wow. So I don't know if you saw this. Oh, it's no, it's really, it's really crazy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they didn't. So, you know, they're not taking this lightly and, and the Tosni news agency was also the ones who were calling for FIFA to suspend them for 10 matches, AKA kick them out of the world cup. Um, so <laughs> the whole situation yeah. is so, is so messy. And it, again, one of those situations where people say, keep politics out of sports. It's, it's just unavoidable, especially when you're in a tournament like the World Cup. It's it's completely unavoidable. Um, and, and this situation is really just kind of showing exactly why that is. Right. And I feel like it's one of those you can't have it both ways. Either we can all just say, like, this is soccer, like, you know, and it's nothing else. <laughs> um, or you can say, like, this is the grandest, most, like, amazing sporting event in the world and it's because you're bringing all these different countries together to have the world cup um you know it's in the name so yeah and especially i feel like in this day and age when you have things like social media where you know it, it's so much easier in a way to make a statement like that just by removing you know one one emblem in the flag um you know it, it's and, and then and yeah it's it's hard to see how it de-escalates it's it's not like and if you wanted to get people together to say like okay everybody just settle down like who are even those people like maybe the captains of the soccer teams but like again they are you know they didn't start involved in this like they're they're just you know they're 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 there to create the center of attention but they're not the ones making these statements uh for the most part um of course you know the iranian players did make that statement um to hop over to Another um, another moment, um, a sort of political moment from players in this tournament, the German players made a statement because um, many teams, both the U.S. and a bunch of European teams, uh, wanted to wear uh, One Love armbands because it is illegal to be gay in Qatar. Um, and 
uh, they, they wanted to show solidarity with the gay community there, the LGBTQ community. And um, FIFA, you know, who's been, you know, just all in on like, everything's great in Qatar, that side of things has uh, said, we're just going to give out yellow cards if you do that. And there's like, well, okay, well, we don't want a yellow card. We don't want to lose a tournament for wearing an armband. So they didn't wear the armbands, but German players covered their mouths in a team photo uh, to show like, you know, you, you silenced us. So we're, we're going to show that we were silenced. So yeah. Just... Yeah. No, yeah, that, that's a, that was a crazy one too. I mean, just that's the thing with this, with this World Cup. It's just line up each controversy one after the next. And, and that's what you get when you, when you host in a totalitarian country like Qatar. Um, yeah, the, the German players, you know, uh, I, I would say that from the, the whole one love armband thing, because there were a bunch of captains who were going to do that. I know that Harry Kane from England was planning to do it. Um, and, and there was a bunch of others. And I, I believe that the German captain usually is Manuel Neuer. Um, but I know that sometimes Thomas Muller steps in and does it. And Thomas Muller took to Instagram and he like really laid the whole thing out really well. Um, he, he kind of explained his perspective on the whole thing. He basically said, we're very upset about this. You know, we like, we truly wanted to do this and we've not, we haven't gotten a good explanation from FIFA as to why we're not allowed to. Um, and the, and what the one thing he did say too, and I actually appreciated him saying this was, he said, you know, there are going to be people who are upset with us for not following through with it, even though like because of the yellow cards thing, he's like, but at the end of the day, like we're professional footballers, like this is our job. Um, this is our, our life goal is to win soccer games. We're not going to put that at risk because um, because we're trying to make a political statement like, sorry, you're going to be disappointed if you're expecting something different. And I actually respected him saying that because. At the end of the day, he's right, you know, the, the, and, and I think the German team really made up for it by by doing the, the covering the mouth um, because they were they were really unhappy about it, uh, you know, and I, I think it kind of speaks to also the bigger issue here, which is that I was on a podcast. I was on a different podcast uh, last week and, um, you know, we, we, we were discussing basically how the how FIFA has maybe kind of lost control of this World Cup a little bit. They've mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it was Nancy Armour from from USA Today talking about she's on the ground over in Qatar. And she was saying that, you know, when we, we were talking about the beer thing, right? And she was saying, you know, FIFA, FIFA said, okay, we have to have this beer sponsor. And then two days before Qatar, Qatar was like, mm, no, we're just not going to do that. And FIFA just let them. And it's the same thing with the with the armbands. I think that FIFA repeatedly said, we want to be able to have, you know, gay representation here. We want to be able to show, let players, uh, you know, make statements in the way that they want to. And the Qataris were said, no, we're, we don't want you to do that. And FIFA kind of just went with it. Um, so, yeah, FIFA maybe has lost control a little bit. And that's, it's a bummer. Um, but I will say the bright side of it is that people are finding, as we're seeing with the German team here, people are finding ways to get the message across anyway. Yeah, and if there is a point here where FIFA has stood up to Qatar and said, look, like, we gave you this and you have to give us something back, you have to bend your, your rules, or I haven't seen it. I mean, there was some, like, kind of nominal stuff around workers' rights, and I think that mostly just came from some media coverage that uh, Qatar was trying to control around just how badly migrant workers are being treated, building these stadiums. There have been, like, little things like that. But um, but yeah, the beer thing is a, a very obvious example where it's one thing if FIFA just said like, OK, like, you know, this is just the deal of this World Cup. You, you can't have beer at the stadiums. You can't have alcoholic beer. You can have Bud Zero, which is, you know, what, what everyone is looking for when they're watching a game. Um, by the way, this is kind of a dumb point. I'm going to make it anyway to like go to the biggest sports tournament in the world and the only thing you can drink is Budweiser like that in itself is like come on FIFA like you know give me something to work with here but yeah then yeah. like to add insult to injury it's just Bud Zero um in the actual games so yeah there there's that there's um and um then um Gianni Infantino head of FIFA you know after in his response to all this um was he, he made this big speech saying like hey no one, no European country, I forget exactly how you put it. Basically, like, you, European countries, you have no right to to criticize Qatar on human rights for the, like, thousands of migrant death, migrant worker deaths um, 
resulting from building these stadiums because hey look at your history look at look at all the slavery and cruelty and of course yeah you you look into the you know history of of england of france any of these countries yes it's it's totally checkered with like horrible human rights violations but to then just say like so no one has any moral standards anymore and anyone can do anything because um because everyone's done some bad stuff in the past it is just completely bonkers and just like He's clearly just so beholden to sticking to his guns with Cutter and, like, at no point saying, like, yeah, you know, I was kind of stuck with this decision. Like, maybe there were some bribes here, but we're just rolling with it. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of staked his camp here with, like, Qatar is just as good as every other country. And, and please ignore the, like, deaths and human rights violations that have led up to this whole thing and all the corruption. Yeah, that that Infantino uh, press conference was unbelievable. Um, that was, it was just, it was right. That was right before the first match. Um, I think it was the day before. And, you know, between saying European countries have no right because they have look at like 300 years of history of like all this terrible stuff that Europe did. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, which was also funny because they banned people from dressing like crusaders at the tournament, which I found very <laughs> funny and ironic. Um, just one of those silly little things. And uh, I think he said, I'm pretty sure he said he knows what discrimination was like because he was like, he had like red hair and freckles when he was growing up or something like that. So uh, the whole thing is just, I mean, it's completely yeah. insane. And, and I mean, it goes to show too that, um, you know, when they, when they got rid of Sepp Blatter and they brought in Infantino and all these guys, like, sure, FIFA is less corrupt than it used to be probably um but there's you know they're not completely clean yet i don't think um i think most people would agree having seen everything that's happened here that they're not completely clean just yet um but cleaner i guess yeah i, don't know. I mean saying like infantino's better than bladder is saying like the new mob boss is like you know he's he's like less of a mess than the the last guy so yeah. um yeah and the one other sort of thing I wanted to throw into this stew here is we, we've seen some um, just some some pretty interesting or interesting is the wrong word here, but um, just some little moments from media members about um, how they're getting treated. And I really wonder what else is going to come out as this tournament goes on or as people come home and say, like, I didn't want to say this here, but I'm saying it now. Um, so the, the thing, the one that got the most attention was a Danish reporter um, was you know, just doing a, a media hit um, near a stadium and some Qatari security, I guess, uh, showed up and told them to stop filming and threatened to break their camera. Um, and then, you know, Qatari officials were saying, oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I don't know how you like sweep that one under the rug. Um, and also, I don't know if you saw this one. It was involved Grant Wall. Um, uh, did you see this thing where, with his rainbow shirt? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um uh, yeah, he was wearing a shirt that's just a soccer ball with a circular rainbow around the ball. Um, you know, which it could just be a nice looking rainbow shirt, but, you know, kind of clearly uh, meant as an LGBTQ solidarity shirt. Um, and uh, he was detained by Qatari security. They said, you know, you can't wear that shirt. It's political. He's like, it it's not political. Um, and they're like, no, no, it's, it's political. He flags a New York Times reporter who he happens to know uh, who's gone by, explains the situation. Um, and then that reporter gets detained briefly. He tweeted out a, a picture of himself just like kind of quickly in the moment wearing that shirt, explaining what was going on. His phone gets taken for a little while. And then in the end, they're like, oh, you know, sorry, we just we were worried about your security because, you know, who knows what would happen to you wearing a, a shirt with a rainbow on it and cutter. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'd just be very interested to see, like, what other stories are going to come out from this, because those can't be the only two. Yeah, that I mean, that situation was was really I mean, the, with the TV, with the Danish TV reporters, you know, I think a lot of it also just came down to execution. Um, you know, in theory, like, yeah, those that Danish TV crew should not have been stopped at all uh, from filming. And the reason why Grant Wall was doing what he did, as I understand it, was that according to the guidelines that they put out for the security officials, the shirt that he was wearing was fine to wear into the stadium. So I think he was trying to like test it out and see mm -hmm. like if they were 
you know, if they were serious about that. And I think part of the problem is that there's there's a difference between what they say they're going to do and maybe they say that to placate uh, the to FIFA or placate the rest of the world and say, no, 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 you're good here. And and then what the security guards actually do and who knows if that's just, you know, security guards saying, well, we don't normally allow stuff like this, so we're not going to allow it now. Um, or they're just not comfortable with it or, you know, maybe the security guidelines were just for show all along and the officials wanted them to take, you know, rainbow, rainbow apparel away, that kind of thing. Um, but either way, yeah, the, you know, it's, there's, there's a whole nother story here about the media. You know, we've talked about it a lot as well, that, uh, there are certain media that have been very critical. There are certain media that have been less critical, uh, maybe don't need to name names here, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, there rhymes with box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> rhymes with box. Um, don't, we've, we've talked about it a lot and, you know, they've definitely been catching some flack. We wrote, I think, uh, Mike McCarthy wrote about that, that we, that they've been catching some flack for their coverage, which rightfully so, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, me media has just been, you know, the media coverage has been really, really interesting as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, we, we could, we could go on, but, um, uh, we should wrap this up. Doug, give me, uh, just what are you looking for kind of going forward for this tournament or is like where where do you have eyes on in terms of both like on the field and off the field stuff like what's on your mind what are the kind of unanswered questions you've got as we move forward um let's start let's start on the field um on the field i'm going to go ahead and say that the united states is winning tomorrow aka they already won if you listen mm -hmm. to this um, they're going to beat Iran. They're going to move on to the group stage. I, I think they, I think they just need it so much. American soccer needs it. And it, you know, I, yeah, I don't think it's anything less than a failure if they leave this thing with three draws or two draws and a loss. Um, so I'll say that I'll say that the team that I think is going to win it is Brazil. Um, Brazil has looked unbelievable. They've looked really, really good. I loved them before the tournament. Um, you know, I think, I think they're, I think they haven't done anything to, make me think that they're not going to win. So I like Brazil to win. Um, but another team that's looked really good that I would keep an eye on as well as Spain. Uh, Spain's looked really nice. They have probably the best young players in the world right now. Um, so if they can make like a, a young daring run, then I think I like Spain as well. Um, so that's from an on, on field perspective from an off field, you know, um, I, I do think that this, that this we time we were talking about it before we came on is that, this kind of like interplay between all the Middle Eastern countries has been really, really interesting. And unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, um, it's not looking likely that, I mean, if the U.S. beats Iran, Iran's out. We'll have to see what happens to Saudi Arabia and la their last match. Um, we'll see if Saudi Arabia can somehow sneak into the knockout stage. But I will say that this interplay between the Saudi, the, the Middle Eastern countries in the first Middle Eastern World Cup has been super, super interesting. And I just wonder how that's going to continue um, if this like as this World Cup goes on. Uh, something we didn't mention and I wrote about this today was that the uh, in Saudi Arabia, you can't watch uh, on a BN Sports subsidiary. You can't watch the World Cup on a BN Sports subsidiary. And there are tons of, you know, there are millions of subscribers uh, to that to that streaming service in Saudi Arabia. And so they're all pissed. And the Saudi Arabian government is apparently blocking it because they're beefing with Qatar, as that sometimes happens. Um, so, you know, it, it affects everyday fans and, and, you know, it affects real life. I, you know, we're still talking about it with the with the Iran situation, with the protests. Um, and, and ultimately, whatever team, you know, it, it'll just I, like we were just talking about it, the, the continuing media coverage, you know, especially as we kind of continue through and we see which associated media outlets um get to keep going on you know the, the bbc's coverage has been really really interesting in england obviously look you know very strong and they, they're going to keep going so i think we'll get to see keep seeing some of that media coverage going forward yeah 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 it's just so many interesting storylines i'm also wondering you know as teams get eliminated um you know some of those journalists are just going to go home 
I wonder if some of them are going to be say like, well, I'm not covering the team anymore. Like I'm going to go to like the migrant worker camps or I, I'm just going to start sniffing around see what else they dig up. I'm just so interested to see, um, yeah, what other stories are going to come out because when, when you see things like the, the Grant Wall thing, um, it, the, uh, you know, the stuff with the Danish reporters, where my mind goes is like, okay, what are what are the stories that we're not getting in real time because they didn't tweet it out or like their camera did get smashed and then they just had to go home. Um, what else is going to come out in the next few days? Should be really interesting to watch. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, this is obviously the biggest story in sports right now, and uh, it's just going to keep getting weirder and more interesting. That is definitely true. But yeah, thanks, Owen. I really appreciate you having me. It's all I'm always down to talk some soccer. So appreciate you. Hey, it's Abigail Gentra, host of The Lead Off, where front office sports breaks down the biggest stories of the day, where sports influences business and culture. We give the latest details on topics ranging from college and pro sports to fitness and supplements. Tune into The Lead Off daily for continued updates on teams, leagues, and companies making power moves in the industry. Find The Lead Off on Apple, Spotify, and front office sports. Thank you so much for listening to The Newsroom. Please rate us and review us on the podcast service of your choice. Makes a big difference to us and just takes a few seconds on your end. And we'd love to know what you're thinking about the show, what you'd like to see more of, maybe some guests you'd like to hear on. Also, check out our other shows, The Lead Off, where we give you the biggest stories in the sports business world in five minutes or less. And uh, my other passion with our editor-in-chief, Ernest Baker, who interviewing some of the biggest names in sports and sports media world, sports business world. He had Kay Adams on the other day. Great interview there. Learned some stuff about, you know, what, what you already know about Kate Adams and probably a whole lot that you don't know about her. Uh, anyway, check those two shows out and we'll see you next week. <laughs>